Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to beginning of week five. Um, so fast. I feel like we're already kind of like so far into term. Um, I think the end of this lecture marks the midway point for all of the lectures in this course because there's nine weeks and we'll have done four and a half worth of content at the end of today. So um, congrats for making it this far. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the only other interesting updates are many of you probably know this from getting emails from UNSW, but the uh, census date has been um, extended till the end of this week. Uh, we're still endeavoring to get your assignments back to you at the end of this week probably on Friday when I send out the notice. Um, so keep an, keep an eye out for that. Though, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, not, not that like a ton of you are just going to drop suddenly because your assignments are bad or anything like that. And generally speaking, most people's assignments are very good. Um, so we'll see how we go. But um, yeah, so you get that at the end of the week. I think the only other update that I have to share with everyone would be around assignment two. So there was a good forum post, uh, a, a question about, you know, it, so if we go look at assignment two, um, one really interesting part about assignment two that some of you might have glossed over is that you are dealing with a Euclidean vector which consists of a series of doubles, right? So your Euclidean vector always stores doubles and it might store it's a two-dimensional Euclidean vectors store two doubles and ten dimensional stores ten but they're all doubles and when you're writing tests for this assignment um, you know maybe I can you know when you I'll just quickly clone this again when you're writing tests for this assignment um, you will be naturally trying to create a it's fine You'll be trying to create a Euclidean vector, populate it with something, and then immediately after that, you're probably going to do an operation on it, like maybe an addition, subtraction, whatever, some kind of mutation, um, and then you'll be comparing values. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of comparing that happens in this assignment. And the, <clears throat> the reason I, I point that out is because um, if, if I just go look at our most basic test file here, then, you know you'll be doing something like um, uh, check <clears throat> A1, uh, 0 plus A... Like, say you're doing something like this, right? Now, this doesn't even make sense, what I'm writing here. But whenever you're doing these kinds of checks, what you're doing is you're comparing doubles. Okay, because the Euclidean vector is made up of doubles. And anytime you deal with double comparisons in this assignment, you're going to be dealing with some potential form of floating point error. Um, <clears throat> and that's not good because that like floating point error can result in cases where 1.0 is not equal to 1.0. Uh, not literally. Like there it's obviously the same. But like two things that should be the same are not because of floating point errors. If you aren't familiar with floating point errors, you don't have to be extensively. I'd probably spend a little bit of time Googling it because it's an interesting concept regardless. But the way we're going to get around this in this course is through, you know, epsilon testing, which is the same way you kind of get through it in a lot of courses. So let's say for a second that we have a vector like um, A1 here. And then let's just say that, um, for example, I want to say A1... Uh, times equals 2. I want to, you know, multiply all the things by 2, and then I might create another um, another Euclidean vector called B1, which just consists of three elements that are all 6.0, right? So, um, A1 times equals 2, and now what you might expect is you might, say, require or check that A1, 0 equals uh, B1, 0. So, this is a bit more of a concrete example. Now, this case has the potential, well, maybe not this case specifically, but these kinds of tests have the potential to fail because doubles um, aren't always precise. So the way we get around that is um, fairly standard epsilon testing, which is that rather than checking if two things are equal, you simply subtract the two, um, and then you check if the difference between that subtraction is less than some kind of threshold. Um, now, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what a reasonable threshold is for it. It's something like 
that generally speaking that kind of thing will be okay um and i had too many brackets there but that's that's kind of what you do so instead of instead of saying you're going to check that a1 is equal to b1 the, the zeroth element you do something like this um, because this is kind of guaranteed to still pass if there's very slight floating point errors with the doubles so how you go about that is totally up to you. Um, you can define this as a constant somewhere because we introduced this late, -ish, not late, I mean, it's only a third of the way into the assignment release, but since we like introduced it not at the start, I'm pretty happy to be flexible on how we market this term. So it's like, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna do this as a global, typically you'll have some people do like um, epsilon like this, and then you'll just compare it like that for all your tests so it's always using the same number um <clears throat> and i think using this number is fine again i can't remember the specific standard yes and then ryan's pointed out an even better way to do it which is how we would have asked you to do it if you um if we'd kind of remembered to do this at the start and i'm sorry that i forgot um but catch two right so that was just kind of showing you in a very very literal way how you deal with that problem Though catch2 has a bunch of really helpful um, libraries in it that would be even cleaner and make more sense in your code. Um, and I haven't worked with these extensively, so I'm seeing if there's like a <coughs> simple <coughs> example. Um, but essentially, if you go... Yeah, here we go. That's kind of close-ish to something. So... You'll kind of see here that uh, catch2 has a whole bunch of uh, things like this, where what you do is um, uh, you require that the difference between two numbers, which in this case might be like a value in two separate uh, Euclidean vectors, you just check that that's less than um, the approximate value of zero with this margin, which, which is basically what I wrote. It's just um, it's a slightly nicer abstraction. Uh, so... Yes, that's that's kind of the general gist. So, you, you know, or, or something like this is all fine. Like, you'll find, like, there's a few different ways to do this, but the point is that a prox is a catch to um, library function. I don't think you need to include anything because the, the way catch to works is that when you actually build your tests, um, you would have noticed in your scene make list for your tests, right? Like, when you go to your see make list here um you would have noticed that you link all of your tests with catch2 uh and then i believe that in test main it actually hash includes catch2 so essentially the hpp of catch2 the header file is included in every test file by nate by how the build configure is done um so that's how you can just use check and require without having to hash include anything because the link is actually linking the c cpp file that's just hash including that so if we didn't have this you could also just hash include yeah, you could also just hash include like catch2 slash catch.hpp at the top of yours as well um but yeah catch2 has a whole bunch of stuff about floating points and whatnot so the the point is that you will have to consider this it's super trivial to consider i've just kind of walked through it in like all of a few minutes um because otherwise your test might fail if you just do literal comparisons um, Chelor says, are we supposed to do this for the equality operation overload as well? So the point is that in any, in any case where you're comparing if two doubles are equal, you're going to have to do this generally. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you don't do it, you might actually even fail your tests in the worst case. Um, but if you do pass your tests, it's still, it's still like a, a best practices mark reduction. Um, Last year, we, we told students that we're only going to uh, give them whole number doubles because <laughs> we didn't think about that till the last minute. Um, and then this year, just kind of uh, slipped past us again. So we make a whole bunch of adjustments to assignments every year, and that one slipped past us. Uh, yeah, so Fison says, so double, dub so double equals, we have to change it to doing the abs thing. Yeah, that's correct. So it's pretty much just what I wrote here before. It's like... You don't want to do this where either side of the equality are um, doubles. You'd prefer to do something like this or even better, what we talked about um, with using the catch2 library approx stuff because that's even cleaner and clearer. Um, yeah, it's... Well, 
Oh yeah, so, and then she also said, so in the Euclidean vector library itself, when checking two vectors are equal, oh sorry, I understand what your question is now. Uh, yes, es yes, essentially, um, essentially anytime you're doing comparison, like, this is true for all of computing, this isn't like an assignment two thing, anytime you're doing any actual comparisons of doubles, it's usually good practice to do epsilon checks, particularly if the, the doubles could be very small and very large. Um, because that's where floating point errors occur. Like in in reality, this won't produce a floating point error because there's going to be no precision loss. So that when I said like it's good practice, even though it might not always be necessary, it's like this test is probably not necessary, but definitely for your equality operator, um, you would need something like that. Uh, Fiesin says, "How do we decide the epsilon?" Then I mean, I already told you this kind of thing's fine. Like it's a somewhat arbitrary number. Um, the 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 higher it is, like the bigger the value of the epsilon, the more likely it is that um, things with really subtle differences won't pass. But the lower it is, the um, how would you put it? My brain just blanked. Yeah, like if it's a really really tiny number, then you it's like false positive, false negative kind of thing. But this kind of number is fine. Like the th the thing is is that for the for the scale of testing you're doing in this assignment and the scale of testing we're doing in a lot of ways the epsilon could probably be zero and you get away with it a lot of the time um so it it's more just about trying to build in best practices here than than get something specifically right in this scenario anyway that's that's all i wanted to say on that um yep so I want to move on to this week's, today's lecture, because that's pretty critical. Um, and this week's lecture is on resource management. So resource management is kind of the beginning of... Uh, oh my god, one sec. My phone is telling me that it's... it's 6.18pm. I don't know why I need to know that it's 6.18pm, but I do. Do, do, do. Jesus Christ. Alright, well that was fun, wasn't it? My lord. Well, that was an absolute mess. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so we're going to be looking at resource management today. And this is really exciting because this is kind of the first time um, we really get to talk about heat memory. And we actually start to understand even more details of how some of these library uh, libraries are written, like STL containers and stuff. So, um, yes, as, as I just mentioned, to date, we've kind of just glossed over heap resources. You know, we've, we've kind of said this in assignments and in lectures that we don't want you dealing with new and delete. We don't want you malloking stuff. Everything you do should kind of, like, everything you work with should be a stack resource. There are some stack resources like um, vectors and unordered sets that will actually use heap memory, like malloc and free, in the background, but you interact with their abstraction. So, uh, to, a, to a large extent up until this point, heap memory has been ex abstracted away from you. Um, but we want to understand it because... You know, if you are a programmer of any sort, you don't just always use libraries. Sometimes you write libraries. So this is really about understanding how the mechanics work under the hood. And the things we're going to be talking about are new and delete, um, copy and move semantics, which is very relevant to your assignment, um, destructors, and then L values and R values, just as a concept, because they'll come up a little bit more um, throughout the course. So... First thing is a bit of revision on objects. So we talked about this back in week three um, about like what is an object in C++. And one of the things we talked about is that, you know, an object is a, a region of memory associated with a given type. So, you know, int, standard vector, they're all regions of memory somewhere on the computer that have a particular type that is defined in, um, by you or by one of the other libraries. Now, one difference again between a language like C++ and a language like Java or something is that C++ treats ints and bools and whatnot as a, an object. Um, it doesn't treat it as some kind of separate primitive type. So 
that's why in C++ we've been able to do things like say auto a equals int 5 because this is essentially treating an int like an object um, that has some kind of construction you know we're constructing this int with value 5 now <clears throat> A notable thing about objects is that you can create objects, you can destroy objects, you know, they have a constructor and a destructor, you can copy objects or you can move objects. And moving objects might be a new concept to a lot of people here. So that's definitely something that we can spend a little bit more time looking at. Now, this is, um, this is also something that you probably all kind of learned when you did C at some point, which is that when you first would have learned how to program with C, you would have been just putting variables on the stack. And then at some point someone says, well, what happens if we want to create a variable inside a function? You know, say we have a, um, say we have a function like, you know, function A, and then inside of that we want to like say, um, you know, int B, and then we want to return, or like, you know, standard vector int b or even better auto b equals that and then say we want to return that um, now in a language like c uh, you can't do a lot of returns and in a language like c plus plus we know that you can return pretty much anything from a function um, i'll just make this a bit clearer you can return anything from a function at the end because um, it will copy it, right? So if, if you use this then in a main function, this is not something I'm going to run. Um, if you use this in a main function, like you say, okay, well, like auto C equals do stuff, then C will become a standard vector int and it will have been created inside the function and then and copied back up. Um, and <clears throat> due to the way C++ works, this copy is pretty efficient, uh, though generally speaking, if you want to create something that has a much longer lifetime that, say, you know, isn't isn't tied to the stack, we know you have to use malloc for that. That's kind of one of the first examples of, you know, when we come across malloc in C. Um, the other reason is because we can't really have long life, ref you, you can't really return a reference to something that was created in a, um, in a function, which we'll talk about in a sec. So, generally speaking, there are three ways to try and have give a variable a longer lifetime than the scope it's defined in. That's either copy it out of the function upon return. Um, that's either returning it via a reference, which is bad and what we talk about in a sec, or that's returning it as a heap resource, essentially malloc'ing it, uh, malloc'ing the memory so that we're controlling it. So if you think about stack memory as program controlled memory, and if you think about heap memory or malloc stuff as programmer, controlled, then, you know, that's kind of in our hands and it doesn't get freed automatically for us on the stack. Now, one thing we're just going to totally rule out is uh, trying to create longer lifetimes with references to avoid kind of copying things. Um, so generally speaking, what, what this example is trying to demonstrate is that if your function returns a reference to something, say, such as in these cases on the left-hand column, int and um, reference to int and reference to const int, then you always want to make sure that what it's returning is something that was actually passed into that function. Because generally speaking, the only things a function will return are um, resources that were created inside the function and resources that were passed into the function as arguments. So that's why we, um, we only want to do that in this case here, because you can see that in this case, i is passed in as an argument in both instances. Whereas on the right here, we have a case where i is passed in, sorry, passed in as an argument by reference is the important part. i is passed in here as a non-reference, so it's actually copied into the function, so it forms part of the function's like local stack. Um, and in this case here, we're actually creating a variable on the function's local stack. So, but it, we're actually returning ints here. Now, um, this here, I think in some situations will work, uh, and sometimes it goes okay, but generally speaking, it's bad practice. So if you want to say create something inside a function and then return it uh, without, you know, like w without kind of copying it back out, then we don't want to do something like this. So let's just steer clear of references as a way to try and solve our like long life problem. Um, the way we solve our long life problem in C++ is the same way we do it in C, which is that we store objects on the heap. And objects on the heap stay there, and they don't really get 
garbage collected, they don't get popped off the stack as functions are being called and completed, right? Because stack is totally, um, you know, managed by, um, I don't really know what you'd describe it as managed by, you wouldn't say managed by the compiler, but it's baked into how the language works that um, if something's put on the stack, when its name goes out of scope, the destruct is called on it automatically. So in this case here, like, let's think about this program for a second. I always like, I always like to ask this question to people, which is like, in this pro, let me, let me remove a few lines just to start off. And my, my question to you, and I'll wait 10 seconds for people to reply is, how many resources are created here? Like, tell me all the resources, how big are they? Are they on the stack or the heap? Is there one? Is there two? Is there three? Is there four? Is there five? Like, what's actually created during the duration of this program's running? in terms of memory that like we've created by writing it. Just waiting for the good old laggy lag to, to catch up. Sorry for those who have already answered and are listening. Okay, I've got a few answers. Four bytes of an int. Um, someone says, would it be a heap? Uh, Ifan says, main function int. Richard says, main. Devanch says, 16 bits of memory to store four integers. Um, Kai says, A is created on the heap. So, I, I really want to emphasize this because I don't think anyone seemed to quite nail it. But, um, yeah, Jason's kind of getting close. But... So in a line like this, I think I think a common misconception people have is that you're actually creating memory here. Like this line is um, creating memory on the heap. Yeah, and Shalor seems to be getting it. So two things are actually created here. One is a what we call a named resource, which is a stack resource, which is a integer pointer, um, and its name is actually a. So, stack objects typically have a name. Sometimes we call them named resources or named variables or named uh, data, I guess. But it's a type integer pointer, which on the CSE machines, I think will be 8 bytes because I think they're all 64 bits. And then we have uh, the, an unnamed resource, which is a heap resource, which is what we malloced um, with like new or think of it, and new as malloc. I think I probably just glossed over that, which is 4 bytes because it's just a, it's an integer, right? Um, now, in C++, I, I probably just did gloss over that from this example. Um, we deal with malloc and free in C++ by using the new and delete command. And C++ is a little bit smarter than C in the sense that it'll actually figure out the size of the type based on this here. So, you know, it, it just will figure out how big something needs to be. So, new and delete are essentially keywords that's like add to the heap, free from the heap. Um, but this is really important because on this line here, these two variables, these two pieces of memory are kind of like created. And it's it's not really true to say that A refers to the, the malloc, the nude memory, because A doesn't. A refers to a pointer. So everything, every variable name is always a stack name. It's, it's a named resource on the stack. It's just that some of those named resources on the stack, like A in this case, point to an unnamed piece of heap memory because no no heap memory has a name every time you malloc something it has no name it just happens that something with a name is pointing to it so that's the kind of situation we have in a program like this now because this is a stack resource because this is put um uh yeah because this is on the stack what it means is that the rules that we learned back in week three about resources apply which is that when <coughs> A goes out of scope, and it goes out of scope typically when we come across like the end of the function or something. When it goes out of scope, it immediately, it, it gets popped off the stack. It gets cleaned up, it gets destructed. So all resources have their destructor called when they go out of scope. So A goes out of scope at the end of this function. Then it's uh, destruct is called. That's what happens to all stack resources or named resources. But just like in C, our unnamed resources or our heap resources don't go out of scope. That's why they're really beneficial. That's why we like using these heap resources. So if I didn't do this delete A here, this heap object that was created 
never goes out of scope. It never, sorry, it never has its destructor call because we didn't free it explicitly. Um, and, and that's an important contrast because it, it really isn't really like fair to say that A never got deleted because A did get deleted. A is a pointer. What A pointed to didn't get deleted. So that's what this means in terms of C++. So new is saying create a new heap object. Uh, typically, you wouldn't even use int star here. You just do auto. Um, but I like to do that just because it's a bit more explicit here. Uh, and that would delete it at the end of the program. So, you know, if we tried to run this now, demo 501. Um, yep. And then we get four. Now, this isn't constrained to really primitive types in C++. You can do this with tons of stuff. So here I've actually got myself a um, standard vector. So I'm creating a new standard vector on the heap that's constructed with this. So this is saying construct a standard vector with these three arguments on the heap, store it in the named stack variable B, and then we do something with it and then we'll free it at the end. Oops, yeah, so this will this should work now as well. And we should get four and one. Now here's some interesting stuff. Let's get rid of this. So we'll say auto B now. And that'll still work for us. Will this still work? What happens if I just say B0? So this one got really mad at me here. Let me scroll all the way back up to the top. Um... And I think you just have a little reflection about like what's actually going on here because as we saw before, B is actually a pointer. B is a pointer to a heap object. So to actually get that heap object, we have to dereference it first and then we have to index it. So when I say B0, I'm actually essentially just saying I want to print the start of the vec like the start of the vector object, you know, so in terms of like, you know, paint, it's like the vector object might be this massive thing. And here's like the actual numbers we're storing, like one, two, and three, three, four. And then B over here is just a pointer to this object. So when I say B zero, it's the equivalent of saying, sorry, when I say B zero in this case, it's the equivalent of saying, can you please get me, can you dereference what's it address B plus zero? Um, and that's like trying to dereference a vector. So that's like no different to just like you having a vector appointed to a vector and saying print it out. And that's actually what this error message, is, error message is consistent with because what it's saying is that this is the same message you get when you try and print a vector, right? Like when you, when you back in assignment one, tried to just print out a standard vector, it complained about this. It said, I don't have any operands to the output operator um, of this kind of thing. Um, so a star gives us four because um, a is just a pointer. I, I want to stress to you this is this is not the same as int four. Okay, this is just be really clear. So I think I've seen a few people in the chat get confused about this. This is not an integer array with four items. This is actually saying a single integer with four in it. So when you dereference a, you get you get the four. Now to a couple of questions here. Um, So Diamuid says, uh, so if you don't delete A, then the heap memory will become a memory leak. Yeah, exactly. So a memory leak is just memory that's been created on the heap that hasn't been freed correctly. Typically, memory leaks are a problem because a lot of memory is created inside of loops or programs that have any notion of loops. So as the loop goes on, they, they leak memory because resources aren't freed. Um, Irfan says, is delete like free in C? Yeah, so these lines, like to give you like the C equivalent of these lines, this one would be... Uh, int star a equals malloc of size of int times one or something like that. Um, and then this line down here, these ones would just be uh, free a like that. Um, so Charlie says, probably missed it, but what's the logic for using new instead of just going auto a equals four? That's a great question. We'll talk about that in a sec. So, and then the last question is, does delete work with destructors? So delete simply calls the destructor. Like the life cycle of a resource is similar, no matter whether it lives on the stack or the heap. It's constructed at some point, it's used, and then it's destructed. Totally standard. Doesn't matter what type it is, it all follows that object model. 
The difference is that when you create something on the heap, it is not the memory is not deallocated, it is not freed, and therefore the destructor is not called until you explicitly do it. Um, yeah, so, um, but to Charlie's question, what's the logic for using new instead of that? Well, the logic is actually um, relatively simple, which is that if you don't use new, if you don't like malloc something, it's just like in C, there are certain constraints with what you can and can't do with it. So, for instance, like if you want to return something from a function um, that has like a longer life than the function call and its function call and everything else, then sometimes we like to use um, uh, new because, it, it, you know, again, it won't just get popped off the stack for us. Another thing is that there's a lot of operations that sometimes, uh, like, and you'll see this in assignment too, is if you want to create in C or C++, say, a raw double array, which is something we generally discourage, right? So, like, auto B equals double um, one, two, three, oopsie, um, double, I'm not sure how to inline construct double arrays because I don't do it much, but in C, for instance, if you want to create a, um, this is just, like say, say, a C line, um, if you want to create a double array in C like this, so this is an array of doubles from C, you actually need to know the size of that at compile time. For it to be a stack object, the compiler wants to know that size at compile time. It doesn't have to be a, a number there, it could be a magic number, but it can't be based on user input. So like back to kind of C101, you can't really say scanfd, um, you can't really do this in C, right? You can't really say, I'm gonna read the size in and then I'm gonna create a stack object of that size. Um, I mean, you, in some circumstances you can, but generally one of the main reasons that we use malloc is for um, like dynamic sizing of things, things where the, the size could be big or small. It really depends on some things that we don't actually know until the program runs. So the dynamicness of heap memory is, is a big part of it. The other reason is that that stack is really small. So if you want to say malloc, um, you, uh, you want to malloc like... Uh, one gigabyte vector with like a billion items in it. I don't think in a lot of situations that'll go down very well if you try and make, well, okay, so vector is a funny example. So I was just thinking what I said wasn't quite true because what a vector actually is, is vector is just a stack object that actually malloc stuff underneath for you. So when, you're, when your array is being resized, as you're adding stuff to your vector or your set, it's doing all these malloc or news all the time for you. It's just hiding them away from you so that your programming experience is a lot better. Um, and if you actually tried to create like a billion size double array on the stack, sometimes the stack will run out of memory because the heap will often have more memory. Um, Richard says, based on my drawing, it seemed like we allocate memory for an object and a small portion of that object's me memory is used for the vector. Shouldn't the vector be using all of the object's memory? Um, my point here was more like a vector will probably have some other things in it, maybe like its size, like int size and... Um, in capacity, there's probably a couple of actual objects that are there are probably a couple of pieces of information that are actually inside the vector itself. My point was that um, B in this case wasn't pointing to the start of some array. This is an encapsulated object. So B just points to the object generally. It's like B points to a struct. It's the same kind of concept. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of a very. Th this is something we haven't done in previous terms, but I think um, I think we underestimated how much people understood heap memory from the uh, their earlier courses at uni. So that's the point: is that sometimes we create heap memory. Obviously, this example is so straightforward that you're kind of like, what's the point of that? But a Euclidean vector is actually a really good example because, like, think about your assignment. Let's say someone can create a Euclidean vector with one element or a billion. What size do you make your double array if it's not on the heap? You can't like, you can't like re... It's one of those things, like go and try and do it. Like if you wanted to, go and try and actually make your Euclidean vector with a double array without heap memory. You can only define your array once kind of at compile time. It can't like rejoin, uh, like resize and things like that. Um, and I think this emphasizes the last point, which is some people kind of ask me like, why can't I use like, you know, STD vector in my Euclidean vector, because that seems a lot better than double arrays, because Hayden, you said that C style arrays are bad, and it's like, 
C style arrays, pointers are all pivotal, critical parts of C++. The point is that they are prone to mistakes. They are, they are a massive surface area of problems. So it's really great if we can put those in the libraries that are really heavily peer reviewed, get a lot of attention, um, etc. And then the people like us, day to day people actually, you know, use abstractions of it like standard uh, vector. So the, uh, the point of the assignments to kind of give you a sense of like what actually happens under the hood and you get to be part of that abstraction that you're normally used to working with. Um, <clears throat> Joel says, didn't you say we wouldn't use new in our assignment? Oh, you're not. We're going to use some fancy tools. Not really. We're, we're going to avoid it and I'll show you how, but I think I've done enough on um, new and delete 101 here. Oh, what is that slide transition? I must have clicked a button by accident. Um, oh, I had another example. Oh my God, what have I done? I feel like I can't work computers today. My goodness. Okay. Um, I think I, I think I've actually answered someone's question in the slides here, which is that like, why do we like heap resources? I've talked about this stuff already, but again, one of the examples of it here um, is that if I have a piece of code like, why doesn't that build? Come on, build. Oh, I must have not put that in the CMake list file. Silly, 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 silly. This is all new code. I've been rewriting some of these lectures. So, in this case here, in this demo 502, it's slightly off in the slides, is that um, one of the most basic uses for heap memory is being able to just create something inside of a function and then return it. And then it can be dynamically sized and it can be somewhat ridiculously sized, so... There are benefits for it. The stack's convenient, but it's not great in every use case. That's why um, that's why we do that. So, anyway, that's new and delete. Um, we're going to come back to ways to make pointers safer and ways to avoid the new keyword um, tomorrow. So that's like so today's like resource management generally. Tomorrow is like how to make pointers and stuff safer. And that's very relevant for your assignment. So these two, just today and tomorrow, are quite relevant. So firstly, let's have a think about vector for a second. So someone asked before about, you know, how vector is implemented. And we're going to try and explore ideas around uh, resource management by theorizing about what a vector might be. So in week three, we learned about classes. And you could imagine today that this might be a reasonable estimation of what a vector is. Now, we know a few things about a vector it keeps track of all your data because it's a list of stuff. Now this, this one we can assume is a vector of ints. We're not getting into generic types today. That's for week seven. Um, but you can see a vector has an in star data, which we kind of can guess is going to be an array. It's going to be a pointer to some kind of C style array that actually stores the data because a vector implementation can't use itself, right? Like we need, it needs to, someone's got to use the C style array at some point. Um, and then a vector also has a size and a capacity. Its size is how many elements it has at the moment. Its capacity is how many elements it can have before it has to dynamically resize the array itself. We've got a destructor that does nothing. And then we've got a constructor that takes in a size. This is just how we've defined it. We could add more if we want. And that simply creates a new C style array of integers with that size. Um, and then it populates size and capacity with that size as well. So this here new just like malik and c always returns a pointer because new creates an unnamed resource on the heap and then we get a pointer to that unnamed resource returned so that's why a new int like this means new int array with exactly size elements gets created and then the pointer to that unnamed resource gets assigned to this pointer here which is kept inside the object so yeah, that's kind of the start of it. God, I'm stuck. Sorry. That's kind of the start of this. And then if we keep keep kind of exploring it, um, let's first talk about destructors. So we know from week three that destructors are called when the object goes out of scope. Typically, that means when it gets to the end of the scope, it's defined in, which makes sense for stack variables. Um, 
we love destructors because it can do things for us like close files and free pointers and clean up stuff but heap objects don't really have that and one problem that occurs from this is that let's say um, in a in a class like this if I kind of have this class in a file so let's say I I'll just butcher this for a second let's say I had a, a class like this in a file and then I said um, uh, auto mv equals my vec uh, and its size will be 5 so vector of size 5 so take a look at this program for a second and think about what's happening here is that we have a class that is constructed and this actual class object sits on the stack because you know we haven't malloced anything here it's just sitting on the stack but the class object itself when it's constructed what is it constructing? Well, it constructs an 8-byte pointer, because pointers on 64-bit machines equals 8 bytes. It's constructing a 4-byte int, because I think all ints, all standard ints are just 4 bytes, I believe, and a second 4-byte int. So what did we learn about how um, classes initialize with the constructor? Well, it does the initializer list, then it default constructs what's not already constructed and then it calls the body. So in this case the value of size is going to be populated with the input size, the value of capacity is going to be populated with that, and the value of data is going to be populated with a pointer to the heap memory. So let's say I populate this with 5. What this means is that if, if you kind of think about over here in our program we have our like stack and our heap over here, we will have our main function and inside that main function, we created a um, myvec object, which has, you know, 16 bytes of space. So we created this thing, this named stack resource called myvec, which is 16 bytes. And inside of that is, you know, uh, three things, which is our, what was it, data underscore, our instar, instar data which is 8 bytes, and then we have our um, size and capacity. So I won't write that in, but it's like, here's your size and here's your capacity. So that's actually what it looks like. Um, but when we constructed it, because we used the new keyword, what actually happened here was that this constructed a piece of heap memory, an integer array, a C style integer array, that is size, that is size ints. So over here, there was a block of memory 20 bytes created that consists of 5 ints. And this pointer over here points to that C style array. So that's kind of the state of our program uh, as we've created it. Um, that should hopefully make some sense. But then what happens is as soon as I move from line 17 to 18, this MV goes out of scope now. Because I'm at the end of the scope. I defined MV as an object inside a scope, and we're out of the scope, so the resource has to be destructed. So the resource's destructor is called, which does nothing, which isn't terrible, but when a destructor is called in C++, um, what happens is, is we call the destructor on all of the member objects. But the member objects are just what's like, uh, are like what's here. Because these are the members of the actual class, the object. This over here is just something it pointed to. This is some program and managed piece of memory it pointed to. So what happens is, is these three things are freed. These are popped off the stack just like every other variable you deal with. And at the end of this main function, everything that we created inside this class has been destroyed, everything named, but this piece of memory remains here. So what we then do is if we wanted to actually get this working properly in our destructor because we have exp because we decided to explicitly manage memory ourselves with like malloc or new we then have to delete it um, so this needs to be in the destructor so that when this object is destructed it doesn't just get rid of its members but it calls the destructor which calls delete on this so, it, it, like, C++, when you call delete on an array, it frees the whole array. Now, there's only two commands in C++. Um, really simple. You can either say auto i equals new... You can either say, uh, like, uh, x pointer... 
let me write this in something bigger. There's only really a few things you can do with new and delete. You can either say x something uh, var equals new x, like this. You can say x something var equals new x array, and then give it like a, a size. And the two things those are paired with, let me just let me just do this, is you can call delete x and you can call delete y. Oops, sorry, delete y. So with C++, you can either create an object, that could be a standard vector of ints, right? Like a standard vector with a million ints is still one object. Or you can create a C style array with that object. So you could, in theory, do auto var equals um, new, you could do this new int, you could do new standard vector of ints with one, two, three, or you could do auto var equals new standard vector int one two oh, i'm not sure how to do that but you could um you could do this you could do like something like this i'm not sure if you could initialize them all like that but this here is actually creating a c style array of standard vector of ints because you have to remember again everything is an object int double standard vector standard vector of ints strings they're all just objects and all new and delete know how to do is create is, is malloc space for one object or malloc space for a C style array of objects. And they're the two things it can do. And they're, they're described in these two use cases up here. So in this case here, we have the delete brackets because data was a pointer to a C style array heap object. Because again, it can either just be like an int or an array of ints. They're the only two kinds of things you can have. Okay. Um, Someone says, does, does line 9 call the assignment operator after new? Uh, yes. So, I mean, new standard vector int. This will create some heap memory. This whole expression here will return a pointer, and then that pointer will be assigned to the left-hand side. Um, and last question, I'll answer. Fiasin says... Could you use var in declaring the array of a vector, like vector vec3? I don't think so. Um, and then Diamuid says, how does delete data know the length of data? That's a great question. So how does this, how does this line here know to delete the exact size of that? Um, I'm not a I'm not a low-level expert. This is about as low-level as my programming goes, but I'm pretty sure that every piece of heap memory has a size associated with it, so that when you call free on it, um, you actually you're actually able to free that exact piece of memory because like the heap is managed, like the heap is managed, like the heap itself knows how much space it has and it's got chunks and stuff ready to go and it, it has like metadata associated with each piece of malloc memory. Um, it just doesn't free it automatically. So it's not like the Wild West. The heap knows how big a particular piece of memory is. Um, yeah. Because, like, the heap itself, I, and again, I it, it would probably vary in many scenarios, but, like, if you, if you have, like, the heap like this and you imagine it as, like, this massive array, say, when you ask for a new piece of memory, it's going to carve out, like, a tiny bit of data up the front that's, like, all the, like, the header data, and then your actual memory is going to be here. And then when someone asks for another piece of memory, the heap's like, oh, i got to make my little header data to keep track of things. Um, and then it creates the data here. Um, and, and then so forth. And I, again, I'm not familiar on the details of it, but typically then heaps are, um, are kind of like kept as a, as a big linked list. So all the headers are like, or can be kept like that. They're all talking to each other and that's how the heap works. So it knows how big it is when you ask to free it, because when you say, hey, I want you to free like this piece of data here, it's like, well, let's look at what's associated with that. Oh, I have information here that says it's this big, and then I'll get rid of it. So that, that's how it does it in a nutshell. I'm not an expert on it, but I hope that gives enough comfort. Let me look, 6.55, let's see if we should take a break. Yeah, let's take a break. Um, and then we'll get into the rule of five, because that gets beyond the destructor. Um, 
The tilde in line six is a, is a destructor operation. Yeah, I think we covered that in, in the week three lectures. But yes, if, if you have a tilde in front of a, a class name and that's the function, then that's a destructor. So let's, let's take a five minute break and then, then we'll get stuck into the rest of learning about how to kind of manage your own resources in a, in a structure like this. So sounds good. All right, welcome back. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, I, I've just been reading the chat on the YouTube, but, but I think an important thing to take away from this is that everything we're talking about is real and it happens because C++ in, in many ways is just a C with more, um, a lot more, but this is so we understand things. There's not really going to be a lot of situations you're having to, to deal exactly with what we've been talking about today. But the point, the point of today is largely that when you are creating classes that manage their own heap resources or their own unnamed resources, like a standard vector does, there are certain things you need to keep in mind. And that's what this rule of five is about. And we've already touched on one of these, the destructor. And so the point here is that if you're creating an object that manages heap resources, Euclidean vector, standard vector, um, you know, standard unordered map, you need to think about what happens in the cases of destruction, copy construction, copy assignment, move assignment, and move construction. Now, I'm sorry that the, the order of constructor and assignment are swapped around there. I'm sure that upsets someone with OCD. Um, rest assured, it was actually more chaotic before I cleaned it up in the pre-lecture. But um, we need to understand the, these five operations, whether to default them, delete them, or custom define them. So we already talked about destruct. I just want to make that clear. So like rule of five, these are five things we need to do. And we talked about destructors because the point was because we are malloking or newing our own memory, because we have some heap objects that we are storing as part of our resource that we're creating, we need to often define our own destructor because the, the kind of standard object life cycle, lifetime, will not free our resource for us. So we need to handle that explicitly. Now, talking about the other ones, firstly, let's just like think about them all in perspective for a second. So, if you have a class like MyVec, whether you define them or not, the compiler has these things kind of baked into your, your object. Um, it has a kind of default constructor. It, it has a, a copy constructor, a copy assignment, a move constructor, and we'll talk about that after, and a move assignment and a destructor. By default, these do exactly what the language says they do, right? So like a copy constructor will, by default, copy all the data members across to the new object. So you could create a myVec object. Like that's the interesting thing about C++ is that I could create a myVec object like this. Um, and let's first see if this compiles. Uh, oh, bugger off. Let me, let me just use G++ for today because um, this code wasn't meant to run. Um, but let, let's say demo 502 here. Uh, and we need to make these public. Sorry about this. Again, this code wasn't meant to be run. Um, Great, so we've actually compiled this and then this will run now, right, for us. I'll just make this slightly bigger. So this is code that will run if we run a.out. Now, I haven't defined a copy constructor, but I could say auto mv2 equals myvec mv, and this should work for us. Don't build it, run it here. Right, so this should work. So the compiler has created what we call a synthesized copy constructor. Now, back in week three, we learned about synthesized constructors. Do you remember that? We learned about how if you don't define a constructor, a compiler will generate one for you and it will follow a standard behavior. The same thing is true for copy assignment and constructor, move assignment and constructor, and the destructor. And that's where this rule of five comes in. So in every class you create, even in, if you've started assignment two and you've started making your Euclidean vector, these five things are synthesized, created by the compiler when you compile your code, even if you just define the constructor. And the whole point of this lecture is that 
if you are managing your own resources, you need to think about all these five things. You can't just say, oh, the compiler will probably get it right, because it probably won't. Because once you start dealing with heap objects, the, the synthesized rules don't really work too well. And that's what we just saw with the destructor. But now we're going to be talking about these other four here. The copy constructor, copy assignment, move constructor, and move assignment. These are kind of demonstrated down here. Um, for instance, this is a copy constructor here. This one is a copy assignment. Right, so copy constructors are called even when you um, even though this looks like an assignment, it's a constructor because the LHS is defined there, the left hand side, and then these two are, are move constructors and move assignments. Now I know standard move to nearly all of you is like, what the hell is that? So we will talk about that, but it's actually it's pretty much what it sounds like. Instead of copying object A to object B, you actually just move object A to object B. It's a little bit weird, not my favorite thing, but um, we will talk about it. So let's focus on copy first. So, if you have a class, oh, let me get rid of my stupid head. Whoop. Um, hmm. Oop. What in the world? Just casually swapping screens. Okay. Um, someone says, why did it abort? What do you mean? Why did what abort? Oh. That's a good question. Double free. Oh, well, okay. I'll explain why that aborted in a sec. It's a very straightforward answer. Um, cause we didn't, we didn't do what we're about to do. <laughs> the point is that it compiled. Sorry, my, my point, that's a great, sorry that I glossed over that. So the point here is that this actually compiled, it was valid code. Like the compiler created this for you. If it didn't, cons if it didn't synthesize a copy constructor, then it would simply fail to compile because it would look at this code and say, I don't know, what the hell do you want from me? I don't have any constructor that takes in myself. It just doesn't exist. So, um, so it compiled, but it ran and it failed. And I'm really glad you asked that because it actually motivates the whole purpose of this, which is that, um, this is again, what our class looks like by default. Back in week three, we talked about defaulting and deleting um, certain member, certain synthesized member functions. So you don't actually have to add this to your um, class. This is what the compiler does for you, right? It, it defaults it. And if you add this, you're basically telling the compiler what it was already going to do anyway, which is like, hey, can you synthesize this for me? The problem with copying is if you think back to our um, MS Paint example, here, the problem is that um, if you have, uh, like, what are we going to call this one? This one is MV. So if we have our MV here, like that, sure, that makes sense. But here's what happens when we copy it. When we say to the compiler, when we say to the um, MV2 is a copy of it, the compiler will synthesize it and be like, all right, I know how to copy things. I go get all of the data members and I copy and paste them, and then I copy everything across. So they're all total new copies. There's no references to anything. All of these, all of these data items are a total separate thing. There's, there's 16 more bytes that exist now that didn't before. But the problem is the compiler, the, um, the synthesized copy constructor has no sense of what anything points to. So this int data here still points to the same piece of memory. And that's kind of wherein lies the problem here. Because it doesn't know how to copy heap memory. Remember, like, heap memory is just super not managed for you. You kind of have to manage it very explicitly. So, when I created this copy here, we had two objects on the stack, but both of their datas pointed to the same memory. And that's actually why this one failed here, because I got a double free error, because this one was destructed first. I can't remember which order the destructs things in, but one of them was destructed first. So it called delete data. So it, the, the, compile, the synthesized destructor deleted all the members like it normally does for everything. And then it called the actual destructor body, which got rid of the heap memory. Heap memory. But then when the second myvec object was taken off the stack and its destructor got called, it tried to delete the exact same piece of memory because both of them pointed to the same thing. So that's why we need to think about what happens when we copy things. Whether it's copy assignment or copy construction, both are kind of the same thing, right? Little like boilerplate's a bit different, but conceptually they have the same solution. And that's why we have to look at something here. So this right here is the copy constructor. 
It's a myvec name that takes in a reference to a const myvec, and then we construct our copy thing with it. We can't rely on the compiler for this because we are managing resources explicitly. So we're going to do something like this instead. And let's copy this in and let's like, let's just have a look at this. Um, so what's actually happening here? If I was to just say, get rid of all of this, um, this would look like a standard copy constructor. That's what a standard copy constructor that does nothing would look like. When I have this now, think about what's happening. I am using my uh, initializer list, my uniform initialization, to populate all of the values of my new object. Now, if I had got rid of this line here for a second, and we just kept it really, really simple, this gives you a sense of what the compiler would try and generate for us by default. This is basically what it does. It, it takes the old object and it uniform initializes all of the new ob... Uh, sorry, it takes the new object totally and then it uniform initializes all of the new objects data members with the old objects data members, right? It just like slots them all in, like copy, 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 like that. Um, I mean, this one should probably be capacity, to be fair. That's probably just a typo in the slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it just copies them all across. But we don't want to do that because since we're creating a new object down here, we actually want to create another 20 bytes here, like that. One, two, three, four, five, like that. So there's our new 20 bytes. And then we want our new pointer to, instead of there, we want it to point to there. So it doesn't come up here anymore. It points to there. So to do that, we first need to create the new heap memory. We need to say new int original size, original dot size. Um, now that, that'll work well, but the one thing we're still missing from this is the actual population of the data. Because this one here has all, could have data in it, like, you know, one, two, three, four, five. But this one's totally new and it doesn't have any of the data in it. So I need to copy them across. Now we could obviously do this with a really simple for loop. I could say like, um, or in i equals zero, you know, i is less than original dot size i plus plus, and then I could say my new data i equals orig dot data i, and I think this would work. Let's try this out. No, because that's not what its name is. Um, and I don't need this because I'm defining it in the header file. I'd only need this if I was defining it outside the class, but I'm defining it inside the class body. So now this works and now this will run and it will not break because they are two separate pieces of heap memory now. So the copy constructor has successfully handled that for us, which is very handy. So the copy constructor has like, so again, because we're managing heap resources, the copy constructor falls into the rule of five we need to think about and um, bam, done. We don't want to do that though, because we want to avoid C style for loops. I mentioned this in one of the, the spec clarifications on the weekend is like, you can do this for the assignment though. It's much better practice. And it's, I'm talking like, you know, this is like a half a mark out of 15 kind of thing or more. Um, it's much better practice something around there to actually use STL algorithms where we can. So here we're actually using the standard copy algorithm, which takes in essentially pointers or takes in, you know, iterators, which are just pointers. And it's saying, I want you to copy original data. I want you to copy this many blocks of memory into the new data. So it's saying old Sorry, I mean, basically what I'm saying is this is the old data structure starting point. This is the old data structure's end point. So there's our old data structure, start and end. I want you to copy all that into the new data structure. So this is now using STL algorithms. This is something we'd like you to do in your assignment. Um, again, if you don't have to, if you don't want to, it's not going to like stop you getting like well above 90, but, well, above 90, I guess I should say. But, um, yeah, it's it's preferred to do. And, and again, we kind of get these people being like, oh, I don't really know what to do here and blah, blah, blah. But 
you know, because they're like, isn't this technically a pointer? And, you know, Hayden said pointers are bad because, like, data's a pointer. Does that make it bad? And um, I, I talked to Nathaniel about this over the weekend, and the kind of conclusion we came to was the best advice we can give about, like, what what a good boundary is between... Because um, you, you have to use pointers to some extent. Just it's the very nature of it. But, like, generally speaking, if there's a dereference anywhere, that's when you know you've started to probably, like... Um, screw up. So, like, if you're if you're like doing original data, that's probably like not great. But generally speaking, if you're like doing anything like this, that's where you you're definitely doing something wrong. Um, so some questions. Uh, Fysin says, is it possible to avoid the for loops with the operator overloading? Uh, it's pretty much possible to avoid for loops in general with STL algorithms. I would say. Um, Jing Heng says, yeah, but if everyone uses standard copy, then the code in this part is not all almost the same. I don't know what you mean by that. I'm sorry. Um, but the point is we've now dealt with our copy semantic correctly. Now you could, um, uh, you could go and, um, we could make this for the copy assignment too, but that's an exercise I'll leave with you because I've kind of, you know, given you a bunch, well, not a bunch of hints because to be honest with you, some of this isn't super applicable for the assignment because it's actually even easier in the assignment in some cases. Um, but I hope this demonstrates the point that, you know, if there's heap memory, you have to manage it explicitly. Um, uh, Jing Hang says, but if everyone uses standard copy, then this part of the code is almost the same. I think I understand because Fysin says you mean for plagiarism checkers. So assignment two is a somewhat hard assignment to um, plagiarism check because it's a breadth assignment, right? Um, that being said, it's really obvious when people cheat and also you still have to write a bunch of tests. So. If you have any ambition in getting a high mark, you're going to write a bunch of tests, and it's very hard to make your tests identical to someone else. Um, so, yes. Cool. Um, that's I'm, I'm kind of really dragging today out, which I'm going to regret soon. Oh, I already showed you copy assignment. <laughs> I don't know why I said this. I'll leave this to you for the assignment. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we added this in. Um, so... Copy assignment is very similar. Um, we're using a couple of other STL um, algorithms here. We're using swap. Um, and swap's really interesting because... What does swap do? My brain is melting. Standard swap. I mean, I, I get generally what it is. It swaps the values A and B. So this one confused me, I think, when I first kind of looked at this a long time ago. I was like, swap? I thought we wanted to copy, not swap. But what's actually happening here is that... Um, yeah, so the interesting thing is to pay attention to, like, how this is written. So when you call the operator assignment, we are creating a new third uh, myvec, which is empty. And then we are essentially, well, wait, sorry. We're creating a th third new myvec, which is a copy. So we're using, we're using our copy constructor here. And then we're swapping our new one with our current one. So like just to really very quickly demonstrate this, because again, I'm cautious of time, is that you have like your like your old thing over here and you have your new thing over here. And when you want to as copy assign your new to your old, what we do is we go and make a like a, uh, v a V3 up here, and we use our copy constructor to create it. So now the old one has things that we don't want, and our, our new one has things that we do because, well, new and the one we made has things that we do. And then after we've done that, we simply call swap on this. So that's what we call swap. So what happens then is that our good one on our temporary object is now down here and our bad one's up here. And then we delete this because it gets deleted once the, the stack gets popped up the stack. Um, uh, Chilo says, isn't it inefficient to create a third copy? Um, 
It's a good question. So they're like, why are we creating a copy when you could just like um, deep copy every member over? I'm not an expert on everything, though a couple of things I would point to are that generally this is kind of easier and clearer than writing out the same logic again, of course. Because like you, in, in this case, we could reuse the logic. But, but beyond that, I actually want to say that there's a lot of things in C++ even I'm not familiar with. So for instance, like standard swap sometimes... Um, like, and I've had some people explain this to me before, where in some cases, I'm not saying this is for standard swap, it's just something I'm not sure about off the top of my head, is that there are some cases where like C++ is very well calibrated to deal with things really quickly. So I wouldn't be surprised is what I'd say, and I could be wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if standard swap in some cases is capable of like uh, swapping without like doing like full copies in terms of like um, copying things over is probably the same complexity as re as constructing something and then swapping it. But again, it totally depends on what we're dealing with. Like we know in this class that constructing it and swapping all the member objects are pretty much going to take the same amount of time. So in this case, I think it's totally fine. So I'm going to move off copy. I think I've really spent a lot of time there. I know you might still have another couple of questions. We can send them to the forum. But the point is that, you know, you... Um, you want to copy stuff. Now, one thing that's... That made no sense. One thing that's uh, not maybe not evident here too is that um, this is one implementation and then this is another implementation. So these are not all tied together here. It's like this is one way you could do it where you you simply create a new object and then swap it immediately and then return the new this, or you could have like a swap implementation like this. Depends on what you're trying to do. There's no real rhyme or reason about that right here. Now, I want to get onto standard move because we've only got half an hour left. And to understand standard move requires us to understand L values and R values, which is not exactly my favorite part of C++ because I think it's a bit confusing. In C++, this gets a bit more complicated. This is a slightly oversimplification, but in C++, we have notions of what we call L values and R values. And most things that you look at or you point to, or most expressions you look at will produce or are either an L value or an R value. Um, and a very general rule, a very general rule, is that if you ever have an equal sign, everything on the left is always an L value. Everything on the right is either an L value or an R value. So right-hand side could be either, left-hand side is definitely an L value. Now, what are those two different things? Well, an L value is an expression that's an object reference. Now, what the hell is an object reference? Essentially, that means that an L value refers to something that actually has an address in memory. It actually occupies space in like real memory in like the stack or the heap or something. Um, it's, it's an actual thing. And you have to be a bit more conceptual about like what our code is doing here. Because like I, J, K, these are all L values. Yes, they're on the left, so you know they're an L value. But like, think about what they are. They are addresses to actual memory. They're referring, they're an object reference. Like, sure, it, it's not a reference in the sense that, um, you know, it doesn't have the ampersand or whatever. But the point is that I is a variable name that simply refers, like, forget what a C++ reference is. It just refers to an object. It's representing an object. It's a name of some object in memory. Whereas an R value is an expression that's not an L value. Ooh, surprise. Um, and generally how I think about R values is if, if it's something that doesn't have any storage associated with it, then we generally consider it an R value. And you kind of know if something's an R value because it doesn't really persist. It kind of exists temporarily. Um, you wouldn't really know where to put it in memory. And this little piece of code I have here as an example kind of shows us that five and four are like five is an R value and four is an R value and four plus I is also an R value. And you just, again, you just have to think about what these things mean. It's like, okay, what's five? Does five have an address in memory? Where is five? Like, 
I know where i is. i is a variable that refers to something. And we're going we're gonna to assign the value of 5 to i. So whatever, you know, i will now be 5. You know, i refers to some object, and that object will now be 5. But what is this 5 here? It's an r value. It doesn't have an address associated with it. This i here is an l value. So in this case, we're saying that j is an l value and i is an l value. So you can, you know, you can make an l value equal to an l value. Um, int k equals 4 plus i. In this case, i is an L value, 4 is an R value, which we've established, and then 4 plus i is an R value as well. Um, because remember, the definition of L value and R value is this keyword here, expression. Now, I know a bunch of you wouldn't have done like languages courses, but expressions, you've got to think of expressions as, as essentially a bunch, of, a bunch of values joined by pluses and minuses and equals and stuff. Right, so it, it's a bunch of values with operators between them that can get like collapsed into a single value. So four plus i here is an r value because where is four plus i? Like I don't like is it in memory? Um, and I think so. Kai said in the chat, can I say that r values are things that are still in the registers but haven't been stored to memory? I think that's a reasonable way to think about it. If you if you think in those low level terms, yeah, like there are things that the computer might work with that just aren't in RAM. They're not, they just don't have an address. There's no, you couldn't, you couldn't tell me what the point, like what's the pointer to five in the stack? It, it, it doesn't exist. That Like five is just a number. Um, by the way, this concept is really annoying and confusing. And you can go Google it and you'll see like 10 different explanations on Google. Um, for anyone that did 1531 with me, it's like, it reminds me of like functional and non-functional requirements. It's like, it's hard to get a clear answer sometimes, but this is my best attempt at it. Izzy says, so wait, R values are literally the objects that variable are equal to. Um, not really. R values are just part, like an expression that doesn't have an address associated with it. So my point is it's like K is somewhere. Like I could get a pointer to K. I know it's on the stack. I don't know, like four plus I is just a value. It doesn't have an address. It doesn't, it, it's just a value that I'm giving, I'm assigning to something with a sense of an address. So, so again, I L value, J L value, K L value, everything on the left hand side is an L value, um, always. But on the right hand side, it's like five is an R value, I is an L value because it has an address. I know what the, it, I has an address. Four is an R value, I is an L value, which we've established. And then the sum of these two is an R value. Um, yeah, I mean, L value and R value could generally mean left and right, but like L values can be on the left and the right. So it's like, you know, don't take that too literally. Um, <laughs> oopsie, I wrote const percentage. That should be const ampersand. Um, this stuff gets really confusing until week eight, I think, but... I've got, I've got a slide here on L value references. Um, I might, might skip over this for a sec and talk about standard move and then we'll come back to it. Let me just check what we got left. We got moving objects, easy. And then we got REII. Ah, yeah, should be fine. Sorry, where was I going with this? I was here. So we wanted to talk about standard move. Now, Standard move is this really weird function in C++. Um, and the idea is with standard move, this gets into argument binding and stuff, which can get very confusing really quickly. But the idea with standard move is that if I have an object here and I say auto MV2 equals my vec MV, MV is an L value. In fact, it's a reference to an L value because, I mean, you know, it's not a literal reference, but MV refers to some object that's stored in memory. Okay. Um, we know it. We created it. It's an L value. When you pass an L value into a constructor, it actually explicitly calls something that looks like this. And it always looks the same. It's always like my vec, my vec, const reference, or orage, like that. This is what we call a, as you know, a copy constructor. However, if you want to call a move constructor, which we'll talk about in a sec what that is. And a move constructor, it's like a copy constructor. Instead of copying A to B, it just like moves the memory from A to B. It's like an efficient way to transfer. It's like a transfer the memory thing. A move constructor actually looks like, oops, actually looks like um, this one. 
as we will oop, nearly sorry I think it actually looks like this if you're not sure you can actually go back to our rule of five slides back here um, you can actually see it here is that this is our move constructor kind of looks similar to our copy constructor except there's no const because it can't be const because if you're trying to transfer something from the 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 old thing to the new thing, then you you have to um, you have to modify it, right? Like to 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 cop to move it, you have to mutate it. So, um, so yes, that's how the move constructor looks. But anyway, back here, um, if we want to create a move constructor that kind of looks like this, um, and I can show you, we can we can do something standard C out. Hello, this is a terrible move constructor. Your move constructor should not print hello and do nothing. Um, it's a move constructor because it has this double ampersand here. We'll learn more in week eight why and what that is. But generally, it's like if there's a double ampersand, then it's kind of like saying this is movable. This is ready to be moved. The problem is that there's there's no like standard command in C++ to say like, you know, auto MV, uh, like, let me show you, auto MV3 equals move, like, <laughs> move my vec MV, like that. There's no, there's no way to say I want you to call the move constructor. Um, but in C++, we do have a way to effectively do that, which is to wrap what we're trying to move into standard move. And I've already forgotten what it looks like. I thought it was that, but I thought I was going crazy. And what happens is if you take something that's like an L value, like a, just a normal object, standard object, standard variable, and you wrap it in standard move, Essentially, what happens is the compiler converts it from an L value to an R value, uh, which is a little bit of a weird concept, but essentially it, it, it t turns it from, it's a bit of a hack, I think, maybe not a hack, but I think it's a bit unintuitive. It turns it from something that kind of has an address and has like real uh, memory to, to appear like something that's an R value. Because if we didn't have this standard move function, we wouldn't be able to call this because there's no way to kind of just convert an object to this type that easily. So really, in its essence, without even overthinking it, don't 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 freak out. It's like this is just a way of saying, oh, can you make this movable? So now when I pass this in to the vector, it will look at this and say, oh, that's like a movable MV. That's not just a standard MV. A standard MV, I'll copy. I know what to call with that. If I get a standard MV, I'll just call my copy constructor. But if I get a movable MV, which is the, you know, like that's like a wrapper function. If I get a movable MV, then I'll call my move constructor. So you'll see here when I try and, when I run this here, this should work. Ah. Um, what have I done wrong? Oh my God, so many errors. Uh, your move still has a constant, in it, does it? Ooh. Oh, oops. Sorry, I removed the wrong thing. Oopsie. So now when I run this, you'll see that it actually prints out hello and then it seg faults quite, quite rapidly. Um, I don't know why it's seg faulting, probably the destruction or, or something. I'm not sure. Um, so the standard move is actually what calls that. And if I just, if I got rid of that standard move, it wouldn't know to call the move constructor. It would just call the copy constructor again. So standard move takes an object and it makes it movable. It makes it ready to be moved, which is kind of like making it an R value. Um, so that's how we use standard move. And what, why we have standard move is that Sometimes in C++, we want to take an object from over here and put it into a new variable without the penalty. We don't want to have to, we don't want to like copy it and then delete one because you understand that's costly. It's costly to like, if you have an object, you have to totally copy it and then delete all the old stuff. Wouldn't it be better just to grab the contents and just shift it across, you know, rather than deal with all of that? So that's kind of the, the motivation here of what a move constructor and move assignment's all about. And standard move converts an L value to an R value. Now, in reality, there's no there's no casting that happens. That you, you you should not think about it as like literally converting it. It's more like it converts the type that's associated with it. Um, and it's a little bit like you know in in C, if you have something like a um, 
int i equals five, and then you say like char j equals char five, you aren't actually modifying the value. You're not actually like converting it in the literal sense that you're taking it and you're shifting it and you're changing what it is or whatever. You're just changing what it appears to be. Um, and I think that's a really good way to think about standard move because standard move is not actually like, like when I say changing it from an L value to an R value, that's not like ripping it apart and doing anything structural. That's like, that's telling the compiler that I want you to treat this L value like an R value. Like, hey, compiler, as far as you're concerned, this is now an R value, okay? And when the compiler gets an R value in, it will try and, it'll try and like move it in this case. Because the double ampersand refers to an R value, which is what we talk about more in week eight. Um, Devanch says, after using standard move, does the original object still exist? Okay, so let's come back to that question after we actually implement a move constructor, because I just want to stress again, standard move does not move anything. Things are only moved by the move constructor or the move assignment. Like they're what actually moves it, just like the copy constructor and assignment, they're what actually copies it. All we're doing here is telling who's calling it that I want you to treat this like an R value. So we're actually just telling it that I want this to be moved at this point. We're saying, please call the move constructor. We're not actually moving anything. But let's get into moving stuff. I might come back to those slides I, I glossed over. Let's get back to moving stuff. Um, moving stuff's a lot like copying, except we're not copying. Um, though one really important thing, you can read through this if you want, one really important thing is that when you move objects from, when you move stuff from one object to another, they should be in what we call a valid but unspecified state. Now, in essence, what that means is that after you've moved data from object one to object two, anyone who uses object one is dealing with undefined behavior. It's totally not usable anymore. It's unspecified. There is no expectation that it's used. It doesn't have to work. It doesn't have to make sense. But it needs to be valid in the sense that, like, you know, um, you shouldn't just replace pointers with, like, uh, what's an example? Valid as in, like, it, it still functions. Um, it doesn't, like, crash or anything like that. It's, it's, a, it's an object that is technically valid, but you would never use it again. Now, I know that might not make a lot of sense yet, but Hopefully we can talk about that in a sec. So if we're going to move objects, let's actually have a look at the move constructor. So we should be familiar with this type of slide because we've seen it before where we have our, you know, these are our default things, but we need to override our move constructor because we're dealing with explicit memory, like heap memory. And what does this move constructor look like? Okay, well, okay, I have my little move thingy there and then I initialize things and I've got the standard exchange, standard exchange, standard exchange. And then I go, okay, well, it's standard exchange. I might just, you know, quickly Google that standard exchange. I'm always scared to Google STD things now. Um, standard exchange says, replaces the value of obj, the left-hand side, with new value and returns the old value of obj, obj. So it's basically like take new value, put it into obj, and then return obj. Okay, so new value into that and then return what was there. And this actually makes sense when you go back and look at the code here, because what it's saying is that, um, I mean, it's, I think it's a little bit tricky, um, which is that we're saying that what standard exchange will do is it will replace our old object's data with a null pointer. But then it will return, by the way, null point is just null in C++. We don't talk about that much these days, but like null point is just null. N null point in lowercase is the same as null point caps. Just let's, let's move past that for the moment. Um, so it takes null pointer or null and it replaces the old object's data member with null pointer. But standard exchange returns what was replaced. So that means that the new object's data gets populated with the return of this. So I just really want to maybe like make this very visual for you, which is that what happens here is that we take null pointer and we put it in here and then we take what was in here and we return it to whoever called us. So our old thing goes into the new thing and null pointer goes into the, the old thing. So it's a nifty little function that essentially allows us to move something. Um, 
and it's standard exchange will be used a lot with like move things. But what you also notice here is that we don't have to deal with any new and deletes or anything because we're moving. We're not creating new memory. We're simply we're simply moving the values of it. So if you go back to paint, bless old paint. Um, if you go back to our old things in paint that we had here, uh, effectively this one is the equivalent of like. Um, you create your new data structure, except, so this is like MV2, the one we're moving to, and then the new data structure is what points to that, because we simply move the value. So, and this then this old one here points to simply like null. So you're just playing around with pointers there, because moving isn't creating any more memory, because you're just moving something, you're not copying or deleting, you're just shifting. So that's why we don't have to deal with any news or deletes there. Now, what happens to the original object? That's a good question. It's left in a valid but unspecified state. And that valid but unspecified state is that it has no size, no capacity, and it the data object points to a, a null pointer. And that's valid C++, but it might not make sense. It, it, might, it might undermine some preconditions. It might whatever. It doesn't matter. It's like, it's technically valid because it, the values that the variable names make sense, but like they, they work, but it, it makes the, the object useless. So the point is a moved object, something that has been moved from is basically garbage at that point. So you don't need to like be really smart and like add any flags or anything. It's just, it just needs to, you know, just plug the hole, put some stuff there that's valid enough. Like it's, it's valid values, but it's don't use it again. Um, that's kind of how we feel about it. Uh, Jin says, so you can still call member functions from the moved object. Yes, you can, but it's undefined behavior. What is undefined behavior? Undefined behavior, as we've talked about, is like saying uh, int a, or like saying um, auto v equals standard vector int 1, 2, and then saying standard cr v5. That is an example of unspecified behavior. You can do it, you just shouldn't do it. The same thing is true for like objects that we move from. You still can use it. You just shouldn't because bad things might happen. It's the same as the subscript thing here. Um, Sam Yang says, when we call the default constructor for intvec or whatever, does that initialize the value to be zero or null pointer? I don't know. I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter. Um, Diamo says, what's the point of moving? Why not just use the original object? Um, that's a good question. I probably will have a better answer for you down the line. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have a great answer for you right now. Um, but rest assured for the moment. Um, Fiasin says, what happens to MV? It still exists. You can still use it. Like you, you could still like, you could still say like MV I don't think we have have any functions on it, but you know, you could still do stuff with it here. You just shouldn't. It's just like you can subscript a vector. You just shouldn't in some cases. In this case, you just shouldn't. It's still totally usable. It's not gone. It's just it's just undefined behavior if you touch it anymore. Um Okay, yeah, that's one. That's right. I have some notes from another week about this stuff and I just didn't have them in front of me, but um, Shalor says standard swap can make use of move to make it faster, like swapping two vectors as a use case for move. Yeah, that's that's a good example. So, um, like standard swap, which we saw. Oh God, standard swap, which we saw before. Like if you would implement standard swap just as like just a person, and you had like a thing A and a thing B, how would you do it? You would make C. You would copy construct A into C. And then you would copy assign B into A, and then you would copy assign C into B, right? That's three copies to do a swap. But C++ is able to make use of a move constructor if you have it, because it can just move A to C, and then move B to A, and then move C to B. And you haven't actually had to do any creation of new memory, just some, just some like moving. Um, so thank you for that. I was mental blanking for a sec. Um, that's an example of why we might want to use move constructors. So standard swap itself, that's right, does use that. And I think standard exchange also might do that. Can't remember. Um, 
Sam Yang says, what I mean is after you create a default object, is that behave the same as an object that got removed? It, I don't know. It does. It, it's unspecified. That's the thing. Like that, like that's why we say it's in an unspecified state. If it had to be like a default constructed thing, we'd say that after an object is moved, it must be the same as a default constructed object. But it's like, no, it could be like, like if you just replace this zero with like a two here, that would still be a valid but unspecified state. No one should move, no one should touch it again. So it, it doesn't, doesn't have to mean anything. This object means nothing after you've moved from it. Um, and Devanch says, so standard move will get rid of whatever is stored at the address of MV. I'd, I mean, I want to be careful with answering that because when you say get rid of, what it means is that it takes all the values out. The data is still there. It's still, it's still a stack object. It just has crap in it now. So it's unusable. But it's not like on this very line here, it's freed suddenly or anything like that. That's not the true. Firesyn says, wouldn't setting data underscore to null pointer like this cause seg faults for subscripting? I'm going to say this one more time. <laughs> it's like, don't ask the question after I've moved it but if I use it, won't something bad happen? Because like we're saying that after you move it, it's not usable anymore. You don't use it. It's like subscripting an array for a value that doesn't exist. You just don't do it. Like that's, you're a bad programmer if that happens, right? So it's like, there is no what if, like the what if is like whatever. Like what if I do subscript it? Like what if I have an array that I subscript? What might happen? Like, I don't know. Anything could happen. It could be valid. It could seg fault. It could give me zero. It could give me a big number. Like anything can happen. That's why it's defined as undefined behavior. So it's the same thing with like setting data to null pointer. You're, you're essentially saying like, like this object is in a valid but unspecified state. Okie dokie. Move assignments the same. I don't want to talk about that because it's, it's pretty much the same. You can read through that in your own time. You're all, you're all not children. Um... Okay, new slides. I'm sorry that that formatting screwed up there. Um, what even is that? Oh, sorry. Oh, wait. No, no, no. I think I actually, I think we had these and I deleted them. And I, I mean, I, I wanted to delete them. Yeah, let's not worry about that. Sorry about that. No wonder the formatting screwed up. I missed that. So that's essentially how you, you do your move assignment. So we've, we've kind of touched on the rule of five now, which is like copy, construct, copy, assign, move, construct, move, assign, and destructor. And the point again is that whenever you're dealing with heap memory directly, whenever you're creating heap memory, you need to think about these things because typically, you know, not always, you might need to deal with it. Now, in this case... I think you wouldn't have to make your own move constructor because I think the compiler synthesized one would be fine. I think it'd be fine. I can't see why we would need a move constructor in this case because yeah, like we're just copying the pointers across. So I think the compiler synthesized one should be fine. I mean, we could try that out. I mean, I think even in this case, we're just using the compiler synthesized one. I mean, if we got rid of this, the compiler would synthesize one for us. So we could see if that would work. Seem, I mean, it compiles. I don't know what it does. We could try it out. I mean, we don't have a... Let's make all the data members public. Let's... uh. Let's try printing out standard out mv3 dot. I'm breaking encapsulation here just, just for quicklies. Um, let's try and do that. See if this will work. Zero. And if I try and say mv dot data, I'm very terribly breaking encapsulation here. This is, this is throwing up in my own mouth. Yeah, okay. So we, we successfully moved it here. And you'll see like MV, MV is now in a valid but unspecified state. So if I try and print out, say, MV's thing, it's like, I don't know, anything could happen. 
prints out five in this case. I have no idea why. Um, Oh, we do need we do need to move uh, we do need to move constructor. That's right. So, I was like, why is it five? I thought we moved it, right? Like I thought we moved it, but I. Oh, it is using the copy constructor. Hi, Nathaniel. Why is it using the copy constructor? Oh yes, that's right. So, there's a really important note here which I just forgot. Um, which I'm trying to remember where we wrote it. Uh, it's somewhere in the slides, but essentially when you, like with this rule of five here, once you start overriding any of these behaviors, like a copy constructor, um, you basically have to override all of them or explicitly default them. Uh, so in these cases here, if you were to say just define a copy constructor, but you still wanted the compiler to um, uh, actually have the, the synthesized move constructors, you would essentially need to put these lines in explicitly. Um, so, back one slide at the bottom, is it? I don't know, that's okay. So you would need to put these in explicitly. So here, so I've got my copy constructor that I made, but if I want to tell the compiler, no, no, just give me what, give me what you think is best here. And then I try and run that one. Yeah, so, and this, this is kind of, uh, I'm surprised this, this is why I didn't crash before, but um, this is why we kind of have to be careful here because what's happening in this move case here is that after it's moved, um, I believe that the old one is still pointing to the same piece of memory. So I'm not too sure why the move constructor would be doing that. My guess is the move constructor, uh, my guess is, I mean, Nathaniel might know because he's in the chat here, but it's like the, the compiler will just try and move these three values from the old object to the new object, like we've seen. I'm guessing perhaps for small types that it's... um. It, it will just actually copy it. I'm not really sure if there's any efficiency in a compiler moving an int. Move constructor doesn't change the old values. Yeah, so well, in this case, it's just not even, um, it's not changing the old values. So that's why we need to be careful here because as you can see, like this is why it printed out five twice because the, the new object MV3 and the old moved from object MV both have the same um, data pointer to the same heap item and the default move constructor in this case is not actually like cleaning anything up it's not um, deleting this for us so the most critical line here in our move constructor um, was this line here this like null pointer like you could kind of get away by like not even um, by like not zeroing out the old size because largely that's not going to have any impact at all it's not going to cause um, because if your old object is not being used anymore, then that's not going to cause any impact depending on, I guess, how the destructor or whatever is defined. So in this case here, what you have to think about is like, even though our old myvec, the one we're moving from, is not being used anymore, it's still going to be destructed at some point when it goes out of scope. Even if it's not used, it still gets destructed because it's just another stack resource. So let's make sure that it doesn't do anything silly like call delete on that pointer that it used to have. So this is why this is kind of why we say that once you deal with like heap resources or once you start overriding some of these, um, you really need to think about all of them. You really need to stop and think about all of them. Uh, so someone's pointed out, yeah, okay. So we talked about move assignment, all of that. We're coming up right at the end. The last couple of slides here are um, us just pointing out that like. This is just a summary again of like, if you have a class T, this is just the copy um, constructors and the move constructors. It's just like, remember that you can like, it's not just that the compiler will synthesize them if you don't define them. And it's not just that you have to um, make them yourself, but it's like, if you don't define any of these, you can actually tell the compiler, this is a big hint for assignment too. You can actually tell the compiler to just not have them. 
So in this case, if I did not have a move constructor or a move assignment, and I, I say didn't have a, a destructor too, um, and I just had this, the compiler will synthesize these for you. It can synthesize the copy constructor and the copy assignment. So if you want to tell it, no, 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 I don't want you to synthesize it, just like we learned back in week three with constructors, you can tell the compiler, no, I don't want you to copy construct this, please don't. And then that's what will happen here. So now when we go to compile this, the compiler will see that there's no uh, operator to construct um, use of deleted function. I mean, here it's, it's even clearer to you as a programmer. It tells you exactly what's wrong. It's like, no, 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 you made clear this is not something that we want to be, that has a semantic associated with it. So um, please don't do that. Now, a bunch of text here at the end. Um, this is all just the details of it. Uh, this is kind of what you might find useful for the assignment. I think one thing that's important here, I was looking for this line. I thought it was, I think it was, um, early, I thought it was earlier in the slides, but if you define one of the rule of five, you should explicitly delete default or define all five. That's, that's essentially why we call it the rule of five here. So if the default behavior isn't sufficient for one of them, it's unlikely to be sufficient for all of them. And we saw that today with like, we needed our own destructor. We needed our own copy semantics. Therefore we needed our own move semantics as well. Um, and when I say sem like semantics is, is essentially like the study of meaning. So when I say like move semantics, it's like, it, that's saying, what does moving mean? So when we say we need to define our own move semantics, we're saying we need to define what moving means because we can't rely on the default meaning of what moving means. We need to give it a new meaning. Um, it's also, e even if, even if it is, um, even if the synthesized one is sufficient, sometimes it's still good practice to uh, simply write it in for other programmers to, to read it and make sense of it. Um, and then, yeah, the, the very last thing is that, um, I mean, we have like two minutes left and normally this would be like a whole five or 10 minutes in itself, but we actually talked about this so extensively at the start of the lecture that I, I, and we've spent so much time on this that I actually think this might make sense. But there's this concept called RAII or resource acquisition is initialization. And the short summary of this is that it's good practice in C++ or I mean any language for that matter, that if you're ever creating a heap object, you should wrap that up inside a stack object like we do with vector. So think about what a vector is. A vector is a, or, or my vec or a standard unordered set. These are all stack objects that acquire resources, they create heap memory in their constructors, and they remove the heap memory in their destructors. So that means that you are able to use standard vector without having to worry about what memory is freed. Because the actual, um, uh, the actual resources, the actual heap objects are encapsulated inside these like stack objects. So therefore we're making use of the stack behavior, this scope lifetime of like, you know, we, we define it and then it's destructors called at the end of its scope. And that handles all the, the malloking and freeing for us. So that, that's what we would refer to this concept as, as, as a best practice. Um, yeah. So seven, oh, just clicked over to eight. Um, we're going to be talking about smart pointers tomorrow. I don't think smart pointers are going to take up two hours. So if you have questions about this today, you can absolutely... Um, ask them tomorrow and we can keep talking about this topic tomorrow. In fact, if you're a little bit confused about this today, you'll actually probably find talking about smart pointers tomorrow will help understand like why this is relevant and how we can make this even simpler, um, which will be very good. Um, and just for the sake of time, I've just sent any other questions to the forum, but thanks for coming tonight. Let's keep chatting about this tomorrow night. Um, Please leave some feedback if you got your phone with you or whatever. I will put the URL on these in the future, but just snap it with your phone. It's such a short form. Just like click, click, click. Um, and thank you for coming again. Good luck with assignment two and how it's going. We can also chat about that more tomorrow night if people um, want to talk more about it. But anyway, thanks everyone.